Dynamite Toronto VK on the beat uh, Check uh. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love My city love me back for my city love And welcome to episode 1418 of Toronto Mike'd Proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who believes in supporting communities, good times, and brewing amazing beer. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. Palma Pasta. Enjoy the taste of fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees from Palma Pasta in Mississauga and Oakville. RecycleMyElectronics.ca. Committing to our planet's future means properly recycling our electronics of the past. The Advantaged Investor Podcast from Raymond James Canada. Valuable perspective for Canadian investors who want to remain knowledgeable, informed, and focused on long-term success. And Ridley Funeral Home, pillars of the community since 1921. Today, making her Toronto mic debut is nature documentary director and producer Susan Fleming. Welcome to Toronto Mike. Susan. Hi, great to be here. So you're here, literally, I'm going to read the sentence that hooked me. This is a, a, a lovely lady named Jill who sends me notes periodically about what's happening in the zeitgeist and what should happen on Toronto Mike. And I'm going to read you the sentence, and this is going to be a teaser. We'll revisit this later after we get to know a little more about you and some of your awesome nature projects. Here's a sentence. The beautiful and fast-flowing Magpie River in northern Quebec has become Canada's first natural phenomenon to be granted legal personhood. That's quite the sentence. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's so amazing. So here, that I'm going to just let the listenership know. We're going to dive deep into that, and we're going to talk about I Am the Magpie River, which airs so we're recording on Friday, January 26th. This airs on uh, Thursday, February 1st on The Nature of Things. 9 p.m. CBC and on CBC Gem. Okay, good for you. How many of your projects have aired on CBC's The Nature of Things? Oh boy, that's a test. Um, I would say... <laughs> Did you do your homework there, Susan? Come on. <laughs> uh, at least six. I would say six. Good for Final you. Final answer. Final answer, six. Uh, that's incorrect. No, uh, how would I know? I trust you. Okay, so we're going to get to know you a little bit. But firstly, uh, it's tough to Google you. You know why? There, and of course, you know it's your name. But there's a Susan Fleming who was uh, married to Harpo Marx. This is Groucho, Chico, Zeppo, and Gummo. It's their sister-in-law. And she, this uh, actress named uh, Susan Fleming, was known as the girl with the million dollar legs. Are you familiar with this, Susan Fleming? It is a problem because my legs are not as good as hers. So <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very check jealous. Under the table here. I'll be the judge <laughs> of that here. It is the first thing that comes up and it's hard to Google me or because I, I am on no social media. I haven't mm. been for years. Um, I, I had this death scrolling moment on Instagram at midnight about five years ago and I thought, what are you doing? <laughs> Read a book. So I, I am not on anything. Um, so yeah, I am, I am not really so findable, which I kind of like. Well, okay. It's, it's, there's pros and cons, right? Like, uh, the pros is less, you don't have to worry about, I don't know if, if there's any anxiety around, uh, the trolls on what the app formerly known as Twitter or just people being dinks. And, you know, this, this whole interesting sentence, I will repeat one more time because I like the sentence so much. The beautiful and fast flowing Magpie River in Northern Quebec has become na uh, Canada's first natural phenomenon to be granted legal personhood. You don't have to deal with any, I don't know, any trolls trying to pick a fight with, about that sentence or whatnot because you're not on social media. But at the same time, when you're coming on Toronto Mike, uh, it's it, I'm going to have to get to know you by talking to you. Aww. <laughs> It was worth the drive. Okay. <laughs> and you're a Windsor girl, right? I am. Born and raised. So what baseball, did you even care about baseball before I ask you? But like, do, are you raised a Tiger fan? How does it work in Windsor? 
Uh, you are a Tiger fan. You're a Detroit fan of everything when you're raised in Windsor. I literally grew up 15 minutes from the border. Um, and so we would, you know, that was where you went on a Saturday night. And uh, yeah, Detroit was very fun. When I was really young, uh, Diana Ross would play in the parks in Windsor. They would do these Motown tours. So Spokey Robinson, Diana Ross would literally play in a in a park. So it was a great place wow. to grow up. Okay. Oh, shout out to the Tigers. Uh, I, I, <laughs> there was a Disney movie when I was growing up called Tiger Town. Town. Like it, you know, we had Disney at like Sundays at six or something, and it was called Tiger Town, and it was like a this aging veteran lost his mojo playing for the Detroit Tigers. But there's like like a little kid who believed in him or something, and he would do this thing where he like closed his eyes and like prayed almost, and then uh, suddenly this aging veteran uh, found his mojo again. It was, it was quite the movie for me. Uh, I Tiger love Town. Disney at six o'clock on Sunday nights. We always watched it. Do you know Disney used to make nature films? So some of those Sunday nights weren't just cartoons and these kind of heartwarming stories. They also had nature films when I was growing up, and that might have been what got me hooked. Well, there, there you go. I want your origin story here, because I'm going to talk to you before we talk about the Magpie River. And I got to know, I, 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 mean, I won't read it again, but uh, we're going to talk about that and this, you know, Feb- February 1st, uh, The Nature of Things episode, I Am the Magpie River, that you you, uh, you directed, you produced it. Uh, co-produced, um, directed, and co-wrote. Hey, look at you. Uh, many talents here. Okay. I want to let the listenership know that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about raccoons, koi wolves, crows, moose get a little backstory and all that but uh first what's your origin story like what made you want to become a nature filmmaker so i started out uh, i went to journalism school and then i went to radio and television at ryerson and i wanted to be the next barbara from and the year i graduated six thousand people were laid off from the cbc oh. uh, from radio and television at ryerson and so that was a real wake-up call eh? six thousand that's hard to find no them. three thousand sorry okay mistake. we cut it looks it's getting better the longer yeah. we talk <laughs> <laughs> but it was still an insane amount of qualified people who went out yeah. into the workforce um and so i decided that i uh, i i always loved film and so i started to do research and thought i'm going to be i'd love to be a documentary filmmaker and at the time i was a wait i waitress my way through uh, university because I switched majors so many times. <sighs> Went to school for seven years to get a Bachelor it, 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 of lots Arts. Lots of people go to school for seven years. They're called doctors. Uh, yeah, not Bachelor of Arts. That was that was a feat. Um, but um, so I ended up wanting to do this, but I made a lot of money waitressing. So I had this option. I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to just give it up and make $125 a week was literally what you made back then. Um, so I started interviewing filmmakers and I said, I'll work for you for free, but I have to be, I have to leave at five so I can go to the dinner shift. Right. I waitressed every night, work for free. And it was amazing. I got mentored by like Laszlo Barna and the folks at Rhombus. And it was really an incredible education. And uh, ended up just really falling in love with documentary film. And after a few years of doing that, um, probably about 10, mm-hmm. I I really had moved to a farm in the country in Uxbridge. And I really loved, I've always loved the outdoors. And I really got tired of people lying to me. Like people have their own agendas. Even when you're on camera, they're trying to spin it their way. It was really frustrating. And I thought, I'm making films on animals. They're true. Like they are what they right, are. Right. They don't lie to you. And if they do, you know, it, it's just a fascinating deception as opposed to this, which is just pissing me off. So um, <laughs> I started making films on animals. The first was a series that lasted for 10 years called The Secret World of Gardens, which I just still love and was just a dream to make because I made it all, you know, around my backyard. I built gardens. We traveled all over filming oh, gardens. Where did this all air, the, the Secret Life of Gardens? Secret uh, World of Gardens. Girl, and oh yes, it, right. It aired on uh, Discovery and on HGTV. Okay, amazing. Okay, back to Uxbridge for a moment. I once got a like a. I mentioned I get these pitches, and I actually completely ignore the vast majority of pitches. Although you're here today because I really, really was intrigued by uh, by the uh, Magpie River. But I had one like a few years ago, and it was like, "Come to Uxbridge because Victor Newman is going to be here because of a railroad thing. Like there was a railway, there's a railway thing in Uxbridge, and Victor Newman, who's a soap opera star. I don't, I think that's the character's name. I didn't watch the soap, but I don't think that's even the actor's name. I think it's like Eric Braden or something. But this was the pitch. And looking back, it's like, how did I resist? 
Really? Yeah, like there's this, I don't know, like Victor Newman's going to be at a, a railroad thing in Uxbridge. Like that's worth the drive, right? What do you think? Would you would you bite on that pitch? I live in Uxbridge and I didn't <laughs> even know about that. Okay, I'm just here to let you know my Uxbridge connection. All right, well, okay. that's that's a good one. Although the railroad just declared bankruptcy this week. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. I want to see the doc on that. I can't believe it. Uh, Victor couldn't save the railroad. Okay, so uh, quick also, you mentioned CBC Radio. So we'll do these little tangents and we'll, we'll always get back here. But you mentioned uh, CBC Radio. Just yesterday, I was on the uh, the NFB website. Uh, great documentaries on the NFB website. And they had a classic documentary on CBC Radio. It was like filmed in the late 80s. And uh, I got to say, I love this documentary. I'm just, I, this is just, it's free on the, the National Film Board website. And it's about CBC Radio in the, the late 80s. And you got Peter Zowski and all these cats. And it's fascinating this to be a fly in the wall as they pieced all that together on, uh, on Jarvis Street. So. That was great radio time, boy. That was incredible. You say that like the late 1980s was so long ago. I know I'm <laughs> that much older than you. Because my think first you are that much documentary was for the NFB in the late 1980s. Okay, no, listen, I was in high school in the eight late 80s so i mean i'm not i'm not too young but uh <laughs> just to see this is also a fun fact i learned because then i'm diving into because peter zowski died in 2002 i want to say so. and he lived up by me in uxbridge uh, he there. lived um oh on the island uh yeah just outside port perry so like right in my neck of the woods amazing okay so near here i do a, a daily ride on the waterfront trail and there's a park called sir Casimir gazowski park and i always like Oh, there's Zous Kashmir Zowski, and then, of course, there's Peter Zowski, we all know from CBC Radio. But then I was yesterday just learned that this is like the great grandfather of uh, Peter Zowski. Like, this is his great grandfather, Kashmir, Sir Kashmir Zowski. And what was his claim to fame that he got a park? He was like an architect, like uh, a prominent Toronto architect oh. back in the day, and he got a park. Cool. So there you go. All right. So you're uh, you're into filming nature and uh, like what's so did there's one on raccoons? Uh, yes. Uh, so there's one on raccoons that aired on the CBC and all over the world because we despise them, but everybody else in the world is completely fascinated by raccoon. It's called uh, Raccoon Nation, and uh, that was so many all nighters. Oh my god, I must have stayed awake. 200 nights to make that film. Um, but it was, uh, what was really the coolest thing for me was um, we were on Newcastle Island, which is uh, just off Nanaimo in BC. Okay. And there were raccoons every morning in the tidal, way, uh, tidal pools searching for clams and oh the, the dexterity in their hands is incredible oh that's how they get into the green bin uh, <laughs> but you know we think of them as the green bin so it's so much more dignified <laughs> when they're searching for clams and mussels right. Right. but they can get into anything I know we've we've in Toronto at least uh, I'm sure other places have done the same thing but now if you have to angle your bin at a certain angle for it to unlock like this so that the trucks can get it unlocked but the, the raccoons can't but I feel like there's evidence that maybe they've even figured this out. You know, if we knock it against the wall or something, I can get in there. But it's quite quite amazing uh, what they can get into, these <sighs> raccoons. They're incredibly smart. And they learn. Like, that's one of the things we explore in the film is how they learn to get into things. And they have they have sequential thought, which is um, a, quite an incredible thing. We don't have it till we're about three or four, where you can put one piece onto another and add to another bit of knowledge to get to the end. Right. Um, but one, you want to know the trick about the, the raccoon bins, yeah. or about garbage bins? Yeah. If you hang them on a hook, so you just have to hang them on a hook like a foot off the ground, like the back, yeah. and then they can't topple them over. They can't tip them the right way. It's literally just a dollar hook from the hardware <laughs> store is the answer to all raccoon bin questions. You are, you are welcome. Okay, listen, this is, I'm glad you're here because now we all have that, uh, that hot tip from somebody who knows raccoons. So, and you're right, here in Toronto, uh, they, sometimes they call this raccoon city or whatever. There's just... And, it, and it's, I find it interesting. Sometimes it'll be like dusk or something and it'll be like 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. And you got these raccoons who are like our early risers, I guess, like they're out and about. And I'm always I always yell at them to go back to bed like this. They, is no, they've early. been out all night. They've been out, but <laughs> they're all going day. to bed soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. But this is like dusk. Right. So it's uh, not you're right. Dawn, yeah. So I, but at dusk, they've been sleeping. No. And then yes, they get yes. up early. OK, just uh, get back to bed. Raccoons here. Okay. <laughs> and, OK. And last night quick tangent here too is uh pamela wallen wrote a book on cats oh okay <laughs> i know it's like it just sounds like oh, it's, oh okay like senator wallen former um you know uh media person in this marketplace uh 
wrote a book about cats because she had a cat named Kitty that uh, like changed her life and inspired her. So it's kind of, it's nature, I guess, cats. Anyway, I went to meet her, Pam. So Pamela's been on this program, but she was in Saskatchewan because she lives on a lake in Saskatchewan. And I met her yesterday at this book launch in the junction and I'm biking home and it's late because it's like, I don't know, 8.30 at night, 9 o'clock at night. And I'm biking through a local park called uh, Colonel Samuel Smith Park. And I pass a coyote. And then I was thinking about koi wolves. And you tell me what is a koi wolf? So a koi wolf is, it's basically an eastern coyote, which is a hybrid cross, which is where the koi, koi wolf name comes from. A geneticist coined that term, Bradley White, um, who's an incredible man. And so koi wolf is because they're part dog or part um, coyote, part wolf. The, the whole story is explored in Meet the Koi Wolf, yeah. which is still on CBC Gem. And uh, cool. it's a really fascinating story because their origin story starts in Algonquin Park. And it was when the um, coyotes were so, perse- or the wolves were so persecuted, there weren't enough mates to be found and they started to go towards coyotes. And that's where the koi wolf origins come from. But the fascinating thing yeah. is when you see um, Eastern coyotes or koi wolves, and you think they're so huge, most of it is just fur. They weigh like 35 pounds. I have a Bouvier, he weighs 100 pounds. Like these things look so big because they puff up and they have long legs, but it's really all fur. And when they are higher, like 50 pounds, they tend to have more dog in them because it's the dog gene that actually adds the weight on. See, okay, wild. And I, I know, okay, so we can see this koi, uh, what's the name again? Koi wolf. But what's the name of the doc? Oh, Meet the Koi Wolf. Meet the Koi Wolf. You can see it on Jam like today. We can pause this podcast and go watch that. Where do we see the raccoons doc before I go beyond the raccoons? Uh, I don't know that it's available in Canada anymore. Okay. So uh, go find that. <laughs> go find that. <laughs> go find that somewhere. I'm sure it's illegally up on the web somewhere. It's called Raccoon Nation. Raccoon Nation. Because I get tired of pulling them all down. It takes so much time. Um, but I really try. Okay, you put in the effort for that. Okay, now the koi wolves um, that we can watch on 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 Jam. Uh, any in the GTA? Am I going to find a oh koi wolf? Oh my gosh, in the GTA? are you kidding? We filmed a lot in the <laughs> well, GTA. Is, I haven't seen it yet. Like like an idiot, I'm going to watch it though. Oh, you know what? I actually am really proud of that one. I think it's. I think you will be fascinated. Okay. Um, because they travel a lot. They come into Toronto and a lot of big cities along the rail lines. That's their big transit route. It's like a highway. And there are so many. If you play golf on golf courses early in the morning, they're out there trying to hunt rabbits and geese and ducks. Um, and there are a lot in Toronto. Like there's at least two packs in High Park alone. Um, no, there's a lot in Toronto. I was in High Park last night. That's how I got back from the junction. Well, it's really interesting. If you wait in High Park or any actually park in Toronto and you wait for a siren to go by, Mm -hmm. they answer the sirens all the time. So they start howling in response to the sirens. It's quite comical. And people think, oh, those dogs are barking. It's like, no, that's not a dog. You know, I that because when Sam Smith Park, I heard like this is like again, like I don't know, nine o'clock last night or something. I heard barking like as if dogs, and then shortly thereafter is when I passed the uh-huh. coyote. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, honestly, where have you been all my life? Come on here, <laughs> okay. And the koi wolves, fascinating. Uh, is it just like I mean, what I do with coyotes is I leave them alone, like I, I very smart <laughs> because the worst thing we've done, and we blame them. And I get calls all the time to speak to this, and I just sort of I, I don't know, I feel like I'm not the scientist, but I spent 250 nights filming them. Right. Um, so we spent a lot of time with them, and I spent a lot of time with scientists who study them. And um, for, for coyotes, it's or koi wolves, it's that us feeding them is the problem. You know, they get trained to people feeding them. And then we were so shocked that they follow people. Uh, and it's our fault. So if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. That's, a good, that's, a good, that's my best practice. And uh, I tell my kids, leave them alone. Get away, go away. And there's signs everywhere too. But I mean, I didn't need the signs to tell me that. Yeah, but a lot, you would be shocked by how many people feed them. It is really like, it's just such a no-no, not just for you, but for all your neighbors. Like, you're teaching them to come to you for food. 100%. Uh, let me know these people. I'm going to have a stern chat with these uh, these individuals feeding the koi wolves. How do you know exactly? So, how do you know it's a koi wolf or a coyote? Is it size? Well, most of the... But you co- said the dog makes it big. Okay. Dog makes it big. But most of the, the um, coyotes we have here are eastern coyotes. And so they are koi wolves. They're the coyote wolf hybrid. That's an eastern coyote. The western coyotes that you see, um, you know, in BC or they're a lot smaller. Like literally, you know, 
this big versus this big, like hugely smaller. Um, so what what you mainly see here, or predominantly see here, is going to be a koi wolf or an eastern coyote. Okay, good to know. On the live stream, so live.torontomike.com, uh, Jeremy is telling us that uh, there's lots, of course, there's lots of coyotes through the ravine system here in the city, but uh, he hears them howling through the East Dawn quite often. So. Yes, that's a huge thoroughfare. And sem- I filmed a lot in cemeteries. And the reason is that there are large open spaces without a lot of people. And so, you know, rabbits and a lot of things gra- gravitate to those areas. Um, and so they have free domain. So we filmed a lot in cemeteries, but the ravine system, which Toronto is amazing for our ravine system, is a huge, huge thoroughfare fair for coyotes and in fact in many ways there's more i know this as a fact there's more per acre in cities than there are in the countryside because they're really persecuted in the countryside which is i try to educate the farmers around me that it really the best thing you can be is a bad shot because you want to teach those that coyote pair that don't come near the barn. This is a bad space. Right. And then they're going to clear all the vermin out around the your fields and everywhere you don't want them. But if you kill a coyote pair, they're literally built so that they can reproduce when persecuted. So they'll up their, not only will they increase their litter sizes, the females go into estrus earlier. So they will have more young by more females, and then new ones will move in, they split up the territory. You actually are creating, as a farmer, you're creating a problem for yourself right. if you start picking off coyotes. So it's um, it's really, they're incredibly smart. They're going to be around long after us. It's going to be the rats and the coyotes, man. See, I understand 100% why you're focusing on nature. Uh, first of all, nature's amazing. Oh, yeah. Like, like so... Yeah, I mean, I'm. If you need help, I don't know somebody to carry like a camera or something. Remember like those two hundred and fifty all nighters, though. Be careful what you volunteer yeah, for. Yeah, but think of what. Yeah, you're 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 looking out for raccoons and koi wolves and amazing. By the way, uh, I have a couple more animals I want to ask you about before we get to the river. But how do you decide what you're going to cover for a documentary? Like, do you have to pitch the idea and sell it first? before you can film it or do you film it first? Like how does it work? So uh, long are the days of triple, you know, mortgaging my house to make a film. So uh, (laughs) that was just so silly. Um, But now I pitch, I come up with the idea, you know, you write the treatment, you pitch it to broadcasters and um, they get them on board and you get your funding and then you start. That is the sane way. And remember, I'm saying this, it is the sane way to make a film Uh, because it takes like two years at least to make a nature film. You know, you have to put in a tremendous amount of time and you, you want to be paid. You want to be able to eat and pay your mortgage and all of those things. So, um, so yeah. get the funding first. Funding first. He's talking, Alan Zweig was just here and he often, you know, he, he likes to complain about things. I like him. He, he's got even got a, he's got a documentary called I Curmudgeon. Okay. He, he lives the role, but you know, he'll pitch a, some idea to the CBC and he'll be like, why, why are they saying no to that? And then he'll see that they said yes to something else that he thinks is ridiculous. And he, he's always <laughs> trying to like, try to understand like, why is CBC like funding this thing, this piece of crap when they said no to my thing, that was a much better idea. Yeah. It's probably a, <laughs> a common problem in documentary filmmakers. <laughs> but have you ever had a, like a, a, a subject you wanted to dive into, but could not get the funding. So you, you couldn't do it because you didn't want to triple mortgage that home. Oh, several, okay, several. Well, like now, now, okay. Let's, before we get to the crows and the moose here, can you share any of these uh, topics? Or oh, no, because we'll they're in that it. wish list of someday right. I will get this made. So who's funding um, this? So I know we're talking about CBC because they make uh, the nature of things. Which so, we love. We love CBC. I know, absolutely. <laughs> and they're going to be on February 1st at 9. I don't know if you know this, Susan, oh. but February 1st at 9 p.m. They're going to air I Am the Magpie <gasps> River on nature of things I'm which we will watch. talk you I, appointment viewing for all FOTMs listening and I've got it in my calendar and we're going to talk more about that uh, very very soon but I guess you don't want to reveal these the wish list because somebody listening will steal that idea somebody will a rich person will just say I don't need to triple mortgage my home I will pay for this myself and do it oh god what a dream um <laughs> I doubt that that rich person is a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> no, but you know, you need you need a rich person to be like, I like the cut of your jib, Susan, and I love nature, and you're a great uh, nature documentary filmmaker. Yeah, I, don't, I won't miss this uh, grant, this money. I give you this money to go do your thing, so the world can be put educated. the word out there. Well, we're doing it right now, okay? <laughs> but but first, if this really rich person likes nature, but they probably also like Toronto Mike, so. 
hit me up too. I need some funding first and then we'll get Susan <laughs> some funding. Oh, there's a cut coming. I can tell. <laughs> Where are these rich people? Okay. Okay. So that's, you know, they, they didn't get rich by giving away their money, Susan. That's it's what, true. That's it's true. Thing. So, okay. So raccoons, koi wolves, crows. Tell me about why you wanted to uh, make a movie about crows. What's the movie called? Can we see that one? Uh, it is called A Murder of Crows. Um, and it is uh, sort of an examination of crow intelligence and how much we underestimate these bird brains um, and how you really should have a lot more respect for them. And I got the idea for the film. Uh, I was sitting on my deck with my dog one morning having my coffee and a, literally a baby crow just dropped out of the sky. I've, I've always had nesting pairs right by my deck every year. They tend to come back to the same areas again and again. And it dropped down right in front of us and the dog was sleeping and just looked up and because it didn't move he didn't even react um but it had bright blue eyes and i didn't know that crows had bright blue eyes and then when i started to research it it's when they're young they have bright blue eyes and they turn black as they get older at about the three month mark i think okay. um don't quote me on that one but part of it is it it lets other because they live in like larger groups right. it lets the other members of the group know i'm a baby please don't beat me up i don't know what i'm doing right. um but it right. was such an interesting it's observation. like baby on board for crows exactly right? okay. that's so cool right. and so i thought if i don't know that about crows what else do i don't know and so i started researching it and became completely fascinated so in the film one of the big things we follow is an experiment happening in Seattle where a scientist and his team moved through a park wearing Dick Cheney masks of all things <laughs> and they captured crows in nets and they just captured them and then released them and the whole objective of the research was to understand how knowledge is passed and if the crows would react and literally we took him back to this park he wore the Dick Cheney mask among Hundreds of people walking through this park, and we did it on campus. Right. Um, and he walked through, and the crows dive bombed him, not one other person. I actually believe I've seen this. Probably. It's older now. I remember now, like a, a city setting. And the masks and the dive bombing of the crows. Like, I 100% remember watching this. Oh, good. Is, where where did it air again? It was on CBC Nature Things and on PBS Nature and, okay. I don't know, like a hundred other this. countries. I, I, was, I was watching this thing. I'm like, this is, I was just channel flipping or whatever. And I saw it and I, I, I stuck around because I found it fascinating. I have seen a murder of crows. Who decided, like, who decided we need a name for this group of crows? crows and we don't want to use flock we're tired of using flock let's call it a murder We're, what's the do you have that intel well that's very much kind of indicative of our view of these crows we've been scared of our fearful of crows oh. for centuries oh. and so the before whole hitchcock before okay. hitchcock he just you know took that up right. um and so that's where the murder came from but do you know what a group of ravens is called oh i, I don't but let me think on it um actually i don't know a kindness of ravens i did not you know what that's a I'm going to drop that one on my uh, seven-year-old tonight. Ah, so uh, it'll blow his Kindness? Mind. A kindness yeah. of ravens, okay. which really speaks to, you know, why are ravens a kindness and crows are a murder yeah. when they're in a group? Better PR. Well, because crows, you know, picked on the dead and, uh, you know, on the battlefield and they'll, they'll get a meal wherever they can. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've had this sort of idea of crows being creepy for millennia. Yeah. Somebody not me, made a joke uh, about like the difference between like a rat and a squirrel was like the stylist. Like if you <laughs> remove that big fluffy uh, tail from the squirrel... I think we're all creeped out by this thing running around uh, our backyards. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They need a better PR agent. <laughs> right. So that's, the, that's what the they crows Jill. need. The, yeah, Jill. Jill, can you help out the crows, okay? Uh, and, and the, the ravens have figured it out. And I don't even know if I, if you gave me a, like, okay, can I tell the difference between a raven and a crow? Like, can uh, you, can, I know you can. I can. Um, so there's a couple of big things, but most people can't. Uh, raven is about 25% bigger which of course you'll recognize right away. Um, <laughs> I, I remember square crow. So squares, uh, crow's tail feathers are in a square and ravens are in a pie. Okay. Um, and their beaks are different. Crows have longer beaks and ravens have more stocky, thick beaks. Reminds me of like, okay, is that a rabbit or a hare? Like there's a, there's these subtle differences. And then ah, I made a film on rabbits and hares. Yes. What was that called? It was called, 
gosh darn it. Um, you can't remember the name of your own film. Yeah, isn't that bad? <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about you. I know. <laughs> Let's okay. do a documentary about this. Oh uh, my gosh, it was two films ago. Um, that recent. I can Google it for you, you while you... It's on CBC. Uh, it's on rabbits and... Uh, my goodness gracious. Gosh darn it. Oh, isn't that sad? This is age. Um, <laughs> is it called Rabbits and Hares? <laughs> no, but it's ca- it's called... I don't oh my remember. Goodness. That's okay. This is the thrilling part. Is it called, uh, I don't know, Remarkable Rabbits? Remarkable Rabbits. Colon, that is what it's called. Rabbits versus Hares? Yeah. No, okay. Remarkable Rabbits. Okay. Just Remarkable Yes. I see here. <laughs> season two, episode 13, The Nature of Thingies? It can't be season two. It I was know, just it can't a couple be, years it says ago. Nature of Thingies. Anyway, CBC, it doesn't matter. That's it's got to be called. like season 62. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Well, we're going to get to all that, too, because uh, there's a new host and there's lots going on of the nature of things. And uh, we're going to get there very, very soon. God, but okay, remarkable rabbits. That is so bad. I forgot that. <laughs> nice alliteration there. Come Thank on. Thank you very Who, much. I can see the boardroom now. We need, a, we need a name. I like alliteration. What do we got here? Well, what, what starts with R? Radical rabbits? No. You know that boardroom is my kitchen table. <laughs> Right. Well, hey, that's, that, I often talk about the team here at uh, Toronto Mike. And then, uh, I just, yeah, it's me, myself, and I. Just, you know, we sound bigger. We talk about the team here. Okay. I'm enjoying this very much. Uh, when I think of, and again, I am Canadian. I was born here in, uh, I was born in Parkdale in Toronto here uh-huh. at uh, St. Joe's and uh, born and raised in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And now you and I, when I think of Canada, I think of like, I think of moose and beaver. Like these are the two animals I think of, even though. I've actually never seen, I've ne- I don't know what this says about me. I've never seen a moose in the wild. You're kidding. I don't think I've seen a moose in the wild. I want to just, because you mentioned er- earlier cemeteries. So this is a quick tangent and we're going to get back There's to moose. There's not a lot of moose in cemeteries. I, I'm no, curious no. how you There's link no those moose in cemeteries. Two. The way I link it is, I just remember when you were talking about, you know, cemeteries and you can see the nature that I, uh, especially during the pandemic, I would do a lot of bike rides to Park Lawn Cemetery here in Etobicoke. And uh, lots of deer, like there was lots of deer in Park Lawn Cemetery. And I used to see them by the Humber River. I do the Humber Trail a lot and I used to see deer down there and it was quite amazing. But so many, like so many, so much deer, so many deers, deers. Deer. (laughs) Yeah, moose is plural is moose, but deers plural is deers. No, I think it's just deer. Still deer? Okay, I should know these things. Okay, I'm an English major. Leave me alone here. Okay. <laughs> but uh, absolutely uh, can't mention a cemetery without saying shout out to Ridley Funeral Home. You move the uh, lasagna box, but there is a, yep, yeah, that's it. So, no, that green thing in your hand right now is a measuring tape, and that's courtesy of Ridley Funeral Home. So, if you're, I don't know, you're maybe you're filming a... Uh, rabbits and you need to measure them to see if they're a hare or not you can use the ridley funeral home measuring actually tape. what i need to do is i have mini donkeys and with all oh. this rain i need to build i need to get them coats you're burying so- the lead here you have like uh, like you live in oxbridge and you have donkeys i have a horse farm and i have miniature donkeys on it and they are so adorable and i need to measure their um their body for a coat because all this rain is a problem so thank you yeah. i i will okay. use this because shout out to ridley funeral home. the big ones actually scare them the metal Hey, so, okay, so we're talking about animals that get mistaken for each other. So there's rabbits and hares, and there's ravens and crows, and of course, alligators and crocodiles. You got a nose and everything. And I think moose I Moose and caribou. Moose and caribou, but also uh, like these, uh, what are they called? Baby donkeys? Do people think they're ponies? Uh, well, mine I are. I have to see these things. Oh, they're Do they look like ponies okay, at all? Okay, I will show you pictures later. All right. They're, I have miniature ones. Large ones can look like don- uh, like horses. Like okay. there are some that are called jacks that are about the size of a horse. Um, uh, how tall are these guys? Mine are about 32 inches. And um, shout out to Ruby and Bullet. Um, and they are. I hope they're listening so right now. Cute. They're just absolutely. Uh-huh. They have my heart. They're really lovely. Play this episode for Ruby and what's the other one's name? Bullet. Bullet. Okay, I like that. Okay, so very much uh, bullet, like trigger. Yeah, I get it. It's very clever. Okay, so Ridley Funeral Home, proud sponsor of the program. Before we get to the moose, uh, do you enjoy Italian food? I do. I love Italian yeah, food. Pause, hoping you'd say yes. Because who the heck doesn't like Italian food? I have a uh, large uh, lasagna in my freezer right now that you could take back to Uxbridge with you. So Thank you. Make, that should cover the gas expense there okay so <laughs> it's delicious you'll say thank you to me but really it's thank you palma pasta and all listeners should know if you want authentic italian food the petrucci family uh own and operate palma pasta they have locations in mississauga and oakville we often have toronto mike listener experiences at the palma's kitchen location in mississauga and they will feed us at tmlx 15 which is going to take place june 27 
from 6 to 9 p.m. at Great Lakes Brewery in Southern Etobicoke. So shout out to Great Lakes Brewery. I have some fresh craft beer that you can uh, take home. Wow, with this you is as well. like a score. Nobody gives me stuff. No, that's what uh, Tom Wilson from uh, Junk House. He came over and said, "I do these." He does a lot of CBC stuff. He's like, "They don't give you anything." He goes, "He comes here. He gets a nice lasagna." That's very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you know you were getting such a such swag? When I you had came over no here? idea. Okay, Jill buried the lead on that one herself. Okay, <laughs> so the beer is going home with you. You got the lasagna. You got the measuring tape. If you have old electronics or cables in your uh, farm there, it's basically a farm, right? You're yes. living on a farm? Yeah. Amazing. You know, you don't throw that in the garbage because the chemicals end up in our landfill. You go to recyclemyelectronics.ca. The EPRA is accredited uh, locations near you where you can drop that off and have it properly recycled to keep the chemicals out of our landfill. So thank you, recyclemyelectronics.ca. Got that one. Wonderful. We'll, we'll do a documentary on that one day. And I, uh, your investments. You don't have to triple mortgage that uh, farm anymore to make these movies. Uh, we'll get you the funding. If there's anything left over, <laughs> you could learn a lot about investing from the Advantaged Investor Podcast from Raymond James Canada. Valuable insight from professionals. Uh, Chris Cooks, he does a great job hosting it. I highly recommend it. The Advantaged Investor Podcast. From Raymond James, Canada, talk to me. We're going to get to the river. I teased that magpie <laughs> river. It's coming soon, but you know, I need to hear a little more about moose. All right. Not moose grumpy for the FOTMs listening, but like actual moose. Moose are so cool. They really look like they're built by a committee because they've got these long legs and necks and these stupid dew flaps. And um, they have all these things that come together, but it actually all is necessary for the environments they move through. So for um, a year in the life of a twig eater, which is another doc that I made for CBC and PBS um, and Arte or BBC and the BBC, um, they uh, we followed a year in the life of a newborn moose calf in the Rocky Mountains. And we were there within hours of it dropping and we followed it on foot <laughs> through every season for a full year till its oh. mother shunned it at the end of the year when it, she was pregnant with a new, a new bebe. Um, and it was an incredible adventure because, you know, it is really hard to track like in five feet of snow, snowshoeing. Yeah. And we just found like we found them. And kept going with them. And we we uh, camped out and we also had a place in Jasper that we would go back to. And uh, it was a, a big team and it was an incredible year and a half adventure of filming and then another year and a half of putting it together. So um, amazing film, A uh, Year in the Life of a Twig Eater. I'm really, uh, I feel so lucky I got to make that film. Just to spend that much time in the Rockies, it's such an incredible part of the world. And to get to know Moose up close and personal, like was incredible you have the best life like you your your job is to to Play. film and learn about nature in this beautiful country of ours i'm so envious of this uh, livelihood of yours and all a film all over the world like for you know we were not just canada like for, a limited need to canada where have you no. been well for raccoons um we were in japan uh we spent a lot of time in the u.s we spent a lot of time for rabbits we were in europe a lot um we're all over the world and we were in for crows we were in us we were in new caledonia which is just off of australia um we're everywhere I've been everywhere, Susan. I've been everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so we're going to get to the majestic. Oh, thank God. Magpie River. <laughs> Imagine we just didn't we ran out of time. I'm like, ah, oh, we didn't get to the Magpie <laughs> River in northern Quebec. We're going to get there uh, right now, but I have a piece of audio to help us segue over. So let's listen to this. If you just protect the human right to water, you are not protecting the river. But if you protect the river, you protect at the same time the human right to water. You are protecting the whole ecosystem. We're not going to have a vibrant living planet for us or anything else if we don't change our mindset and our law. We can change laws. I mean, a hundred years ago in this country, the Elections Act said no woman, idiot, lunatic or child shall vote, you know, like we can change. We can change. Talk to me. First of all, tell me about the Magpie River. Well, first I'll tell you about the yeah. clip. So the yeah, first please. speaker is an incredible lawyer um, called Yenny Cardenas Vega. 
Yenny Vega Cardenas. I'm sorry, Yenny. Um, and uh, she was the powerhouse behind getting the Magpie River legal personhood. Uh, her and her team worked uh, really closely with uh, the Inu and with local um, non-Indigenous people to push this through. And the second clip was by Maud Barlow, the incredible Maud Barlow, who is just a force of nature. Um, she's so inspiring. She's just got so much passion for the environment. I really have enjoyed getting to know her so much. So though, both of those people are featured in the film and uh, they're the kind of people you meet that make a difference in your life. Like they're inspiring. I want to be a better person because I've been able to hang out with both of them. Okay. I'm so intrigued. So tell me, tell me more in great detail. Like tell me about the Magpie River and then we have to dive into like, why would you, like, why would you grant, like, what, do, what are the benefits of gr- exactly specifically of granting legal personhood to like a part of nature? Like nature's not people, right? How do you, like, I am so intrigued by this all. Well, before I tell you about the magpie, I'll just say that, you know, legal personhood is a legal construct. And so, you know, we have, you know, legal personhood, but corporations have legal personhood. Right, right. Um just, Right. Charities have legal personhood. Ships have legal personhood. So if Walmart can have legal personhood, why can't a river or a forest? That's yeah, just a misnomer, right? We just need to rebrand this thing. We really do. It just means that you have rights under the law, that you can have a voice in our courts. So by gain by the Magpie River gaining legal personhood, it has a voice in our court system. And for good or for bad, everything in this country and in most, you know, first world countries runs by a court system. So it just seems like an idea that's time has come that the natural world should be able to speak up for itself or have guardians that speak up for itself to say, Hey, you don't get to damn me or you don't get to build a um, a garbage, you know, dump in the middle of my trees. Um, And so it, it really is one of those things that once you start to wrap your head around makes perfect sense. Well, uh, later in this conversation, after I get a better uh, understanding of, you know, the, the glory of the, the majestic glory of the Magpie River and a little bit more about the actual river itself. I have, uh, it was sent to me by Jill, actually, that I have these nine rights. These are the nine rights the Magpie River was granted with legal personhood. And uh, maybe we can walk, just walk through them sure. uh, at the end of this convo. But first, for the ignorant Torontonians who are like, I don't know where or what the Magpie River is. Let's educate these ignoramuses most people don't know where the magpie river oh, is. i feel better now like i was yesterday i had a a guy he wonderful guy named sean burns who lives in winnipeg and he's really into what's called like lost country he calls it it's the country musicians and songs that seem to be lost to history like no one they're so obscure in this country like specifically to canada so like, we did this deep dive into lost country and he would drop names that aren't like oh these are not lost country musicians everybody knows these people and he'd drop a name like a, a huge name that like a literally of an artist who performed on Tears Are Not Enough, the charity single in 1985. And I heard the name and I was like, I don't know this name. Like it just never, it didn't resonate with me at all. Like I am so, I felt such shame for not knowing Carol Baker, for example. How do I not know Carol Baker? Like how do, do you, know how Carol do you Baker? not know Carol I know. Baker? <laughs> I know, I know Anne Murray. Yeah. It's, firstly, it starts by like not having any interest in country music. So yeah. when you're exposed, like unlike when I saw the dive, the crows dive bombing in that city, uh, Seattle. Scene, Seattle, I got to stick around and learn more. I'm intrigued. But when I'm channel surfing or on the radio or anywhere and there's a country song, I'm gone. Like I just flip uh, away. See, I so like I, country. That's how I know. Okay. I just feel terrible that uh, this artist literally is singing with like, uh, I think with Randy Bachman. I'm not sure. Who, yeah. But they're on Tears Are Not Enough and I did not know Carol Baker. So I feel that shame of being such so ignorant. And well, then when I learned the Magpie River, I'm like, I don't know the Magpie River. Uh, maybe I'll pretend like l- some dumb listeners don't know the Magpie River and then she'll explain it to me and I'll know but now you're telling me a lot of people don't know the Magpie River. And you know, that whole section, the whole North Shore of Quebec, is not something that even Quebecers know a lot about. Um, it's huge swaths of wilderness uh, without roads through a lot of it, so it's difficult to get to. I mean, this was, so the Magpie River yeah. um, runs, it's just incredible. It's one of the last free-flowing wild rivers in northern Quebec, an area that has many, many, or had many, many wild, long, wild rivers, but so many of them have been dammed for hydroelectric power. So the Magpie runs from, the headwaters are at the border of Labrador and Quebec. 
Okay. So all the way up there in the north, and it tumbles all the way down through this incredible shield and waterfalls and oh, the granite um, cliffs. I yes, was about. Right. super like they're you know like skyscrapers all around you. Right. Um, and through pristine boreal forests, and it comes out at the Gulf of Saint Lawrence. So it's almost 300 kilometers long, and it starts in tundra and then goes through boreal forest. It has a really diverse habitat all around it. Um, and most people don't know about it because in order to get to travel the Magpie River, you have right. to helicopter in or float plane in. It's thick forest. You can't move through. There's only one way down, which is on the river, right. which is class you know three, four, and five. It's, it's really big rapids. Um, and I've done it twice. It is tough. Um, and so a lot of people don't know about it, but they should because this whole area is just, it's part of the largest boreal forest on the planet. We're not talking just Canada. We're talking on the planet. It's this contiguous boreal forest that runs all the way from BC to Labrador. Um, it is full of lynx and osprey and bear and um, woodland caribou, which are endangered, uh, like so many beautiful animals um, in the water is just incredibly cold and bubbling because it's moving over rocks at a high speed. There's these huge speckled trout in it, which I've never seen such colorful fish in my life. Um, it is really an incredible part of the world. And the Inu uh, who live in that area are called the Inu of Ukunichit. That's the community. And they have been fighting for over 20 years to protect this river. They don't, it's, for them, it's really sacred. And they don't want to see it be dammed by Hydro-Quebec, right. which has, it's been threatened to like be dammed. dammed. That's like, it means two things being dammed. <laughs> it does. It almost like the same thing synonymously. Um, right. they, um, they have been fighting, as have the local population. But for the Inu, the rocks are ancestors. Like right. they, they've, they've traveled this river for millennia. This is part of their territorial lands and they're very protective of them, rightly so. So it was really incredible, one, to be able to get their permission to come on these lands and to make this film, um, to learn more about how they view the river and their long history with the river, yeah. how they get medicine, like they call it their, their pharmacy. There's medicines they collect all along the river. It's their grocery store. Um, they've, they've for, for family after family, if traveled up this river uh, every every summer and then traveled back down to have supplies for the winter. And so it was really special to be able to spend time with them and on this river because I've never been near anything like it. Like, it's so loud. How long did you spend on the, the magpie? Uh, we probably spent two months on the river just in a go. But then we went up for, I probably have been on it like to, for like 10 day trips besides that for eight times. So six months um, at least, maybe seven. Um, and all through the season. So, so in the middle of winter when, oh my God, we were at the headwaters of the Magpie in February. It was negative 40. The helicopter land and landed. And I thought, I was ready to jump out, which is what we normally do. You know, right. you jump out, you have to have your snowshoes on and make yourself as big as possible because you're just going to drop like six feet into snow and, and digging out is exhausting. So you try to make yourself big so you don't drop too far into the snow. Well, we just got out and we were on rock. I thought it was going to be just complete snow cover. Right. It is just ancient rock up there. 40 kilometer, no, 140 like we couldn't stand up the wind was so strong and just the reason there was no snow is it's moving all that snow over the rocks we you would get frostbite if your skin was exposed for more than a minute we were literally the camera assistant and i are throwing our bodies in front of the tripod so the cameraman can film because what's the matter no, no. Oh, oh no, no. Um, I'm listening to you. No, oh, okay. No. okay. Um, because it, that's my uh, fascinating story face. <laughs> you just because it was, it, the wind was so strong, he couldn't get purchase on the rocks. Um, and yet, at the same time, it was magical. I've never been anywhere like that. And I've been all over the world. Um, so it was really incredible filming up there. And we've, we've done it all through the seasons. You know, we were there in the, the heart of winter several times. Um, we were there for spring, which is just this incredible freshet, the melt, where all the waters off the headway and all through the lands come down into the river. At points, the river grows a hundred feet. I mean, it's just 
rushing. Everything's melting. It's incredible. Um, and in summer, there are so many black flies. Um, oh. It is just. I'm canceling my trip here. I was on my phone oh. booking my trip but to the Magpie. You know what? Go in late. Uh, there's the last right. two weeks of August and September. Okay. Mm, unbelievable. Not a black fly in sight. All right. First time I went was August. I did not know there were that many black flies. When I went back in July, I almost died. Um, well, you know, Gordon Lightfoot could have had a song, Black Flies in July. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Very Canadian. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an incredible part of the world. It's really, um, and you know, National Geographic named it one of the top uh, five paddling destinations in the world. I'll bet. So, so it's it's the amazing. Magpie River. So Susan, I'm listening to you talk about the Magpie River. It love listening to you talk. I can't imagine that we get to see this footage on February 1st on CBC or CBC Gem. It's amazing. We have to protect the Magpie. We do. And so many other things. We have to protect the magpie. We have to protect forests. We have to protect the breeding grounds for the orca in BC. Um, there's just so many things we need to protect in this new you know, legal um, precedent. Right. This idea of rights of nature and legal personhood for natural phenomena is something we need to embrace. Um, it's really going to be a game changer for conservation groups around the world and in Canada. Absolutely. Uh it, it allows you to formally recognize the inherent value of nature, which is which is amazing. And I was reading in the notes that uh, other countries have done this. So so Chile and uh, Australia, Bolivia and New Zealand, for example, have, have done this. And now the Magpie River. So when did this happen? When did this designation, uh, when did this happen for the Magpie? When did they get granted the right of legal personhood? The Magpie uh, River? It happened in 2021 <laughs> through sister resolutions from the um, Inu of Uknichit, uh, the Council of the Inu of Uknichit, and the local um, county of Mengani in Quebec, which is the size of Ireland. We're not talking about a small place. Like, it's a huge okay. um, area that, that is administered by the Mengani Council and um, or county. And uh, so those two sister resolutions went forward. And because of the Indigenous support and um, participation, they further protection is gained by... Um, the UN Council on Indigenous Rights. So that puts kind of a world protection on it. Wow. But, you know, nothing is ever secure. Um, the battle, need, like this is an incredible accomplishment mm. and uh, took years and years of work. And I'm so inspired by everyone who put their energies into it. But they have to keep fighting. You know, Hydro-Quebec is very strong. They continually want to develop the Magpie among other rivers, but it's one of the last big rivers like this uh, so they still have their sights on it and so you know this is an important accomplishment but the fight is definitely not over no no that's i'm glad you're shining a light on this so where in this process did you decide that uh you would seek funding to make this film like is it when you did you open up the paper one day and see oh they're the Magpie River is being granted uh, the right of legal personhood. We should explore that. Like, where did you get this idea? That's exactly it. Yeah. I read it and I thought, what is this idea of legal personhood for a river? I've sure. never heard of that. And I started doing the research and read about um, the Wanganui River in uh, New Zealand and how that was protected and about Bolivia and in Ecuador. And I just thought this this is incredible that this is possible. Um, and so the more I read about it, the more I thought, I want to go see this river. Um, I want to meet the people who fought so hard for this and who came up with this brilliant idea. And then I realized it's been around since the 1970s. You know, um, a BC lawyer named Stone came up with this idea. And so it's been around for a long time. That's and a it's, perfect name for like an environment lawyer. It's true. Stone. <laughs> but you know what's Stone interesting? Rock. It's just starting to catch on. Like it's really gaining strength. Yeah. And so... So, and what I love about the magpie is it's the first natural phenomena in the world that's gained legal pers personhood through joint efforts from indigenous and non-indigenous people. Everything else has been put forward by indigenous people. And so this idea that we can all join together to make this kind of massive change for our community and our world, um, I find that really exciting. No, this is, I'm very excited. Okay. I can't fake excitement on this show. This is all real. Uh, now, you explained earlier you don't want to triple mortgage your home to make these things. So you had the idea after, you know, you're, you're always on the lookout for these interesting uh, subjects to, to, to make films about. And you, you learn about the Magpie River and then you're like, I want to do this and you do whatever. So then do you go to CBC and say, I, I would like to do this. I need this much funding to make it happen. Is that essentially how it works? Well, you have to kind of figure out your concept and how you're right. going to approach it. And this one was a little different because... 
it's not a cute animal with a face and ears that people oh, are going to fall true. in love right. with, right? right? So it's a big picture cell. Right. Um, and much to my incredible amazement and forever appreciation, mm -hmm. I went to Sue Dando, who's the commissioning editor of CBC's The Nature Things, and she got it. Like, we've worked together quite a lot. Mm. That doesn't mean she's going to say yes in any way. And she really got it and saw the long-term effects of this kind of legislation and how it can change our world. And she was our champion and she really helped push this through. Uh, we got Tele-Quebec on board. We got ZDF in Germany and Arte in France. Um, and my co-producers who are Terra Inu Productions in, in uh, Quebec. And so all of us, you know, just joined together to make, make this happen. You know, I'm just a regular guy here in my basement chatting you up, but I think this is more impressive than the girl with the million dollar legs. <laughs> I just want to say that Susan Fleming, not interested in the girl with the million dollar legs. I'm more interested in learning about uh, the Magpie River here. Okay. And I mentioned, I teased earlier, I had the, uh, the nine rights, which we're going to uh, get to in a moment. I'm just going to read to you some real time comments on the live stream. It is at live.torontomike.com. Sounds like an incredible journey. Makes me want to watch the doc. That's the whole point, right, Susan? Yay! Look, please watch, watch the please doc. Watch. Come on. And stream it on... I feel like they don't know... Like, there's no mechanism to say that, you know, somebody watched... You know, unless you're carrying one of those PBM devices, which very few people have. You, they don't know when you watch, but they do. They do. I feel they have metrics for streaming. Like, I think it's better for you that they stream it on Gem because they can actually see, oh, there's a unique stream happening from this IP address. You see, they can't track that on television. It's true. I, I mean, there is like I'm I do, just thinking about they, they your ben get, benefiting you. Like, hey, this we got lots of. We oh, need I'll take more of this. any which way you can watch it. So I really watch it will both. watch it both. Watch okay. it both. Watch and I think TV. when you stream it, you have to leave it on for a certain amount of time. I, I don't know how the long rules. is this dog. It's an hour, right? It's an hour. Yeah, yeah. And the nature of things. And uh, who's the current? Uh, I I know the answer, but who is the current host of the uh, nature of things? Well, there's two. Uh, there's uh, Sarika Kalis. Uh, Suzuki, who is the narrator of this film, and she did a really great job. I'm really impressed. That's quite the last name, Suzuki. Where yeah. have I heard that before? <laughs> but she's a marine biologist, so she was really into it. Um, because one of the things we really explore in the doc is this idea of fresh water and the importance right. of fresh water. I think it's going to be the next oil, like especially for Canada, because there's it's a resource we that is not infinite and it is so critical to human Vital. health and life right. and we have an abundance and we're taking it for granted and um, one of the things we really explore in the film is the importance of fresh water that comes from things like the river like the oceans get fed by the rivers like everybody's on ocean conservation right. and no one's on river conservation and I think this is going to be the next big cause that we need to embrace well you you know creating awareness by uh, you know producing this documentary that will premiere on CBC the nature of things thursday february 1st at 9 p.m eastern you can you can send me the check later jill that was quite the sell <laughs> but th this is creating awareness i didn't know yeah. about the magpie river i didn't know about this we're going to talk about the nine rights right now i like the fact she's a um uh, uh suzuki there's a marine biologist because uh, i always think uh, when george costanza would tell people he was a marine biologist right that was not true suzuki is a marine biologist she is indeed okay I, that was a good episode of seinfeld okay so let's walk through this before I find out and prepping you for this, Susan, like I'm going to want to know at least a clue of like what will the next, you're probably already working on it, but uh, what's the next project going no, to no, be? No, no, you got to read the nine rights. Don't, yeah. don't dissuade from that. <laughs> this is the tease. Like that's coming up after the nine rights. We're doing the nine rights right now. You ready? And uh, I'll do it one at a time. Maybe I'll just do them all. Okay. The nine rights, the Magpie River was granted with legal personhood. Number one. The right to live, to exist, and to flow. I like that. It's okay. great. That's great. Okay, so the right to live, to exist, and to flow. Okay, number two. And live, so you're recognizing it as an entity with life. Right, love this. Uh, and I love that uh, this precedent gets set with the Magpie River. And like, there's so many applications. On the live stream, uh, there was some hope that we protect our Toronto watershed and headwaters more in the future. Oh, like this, so important. Maybe that's the next doc. That we'll talk about great. that in a moment. Okay. Number two, the right to the res to the respect for its natural cycles. That's awkward as I read it. The right to the respect for its To respect for its natural. Okay. There's a typo in my notes here. Oh, okay. sorry. I'm going to blame uh, Jill for this. Jill, you've ruined everything. Delete. Okay. The right to respect its natural cycles. 
Okay. So the freshet in the spring where the big melt happens. Right. Um, so, it, you know, as the seasons go through, the river changes. Okay. Excellent. Number three, the right to evolve naturally to be protected and preserved. Speaks for itself. Very important. Okay. Number four. I feel like David Letterman now. Number four. <laughs> <laughs> the, the right to maintain its natural biodiversity. Which is huge. I mean, because if you start putting chemicals into a river, you affect all the diversity. And we see that even with damming. Like damming changes the water temperature. It changes the flow of nutrients. So animals can't rely on the river anymore. In fact, in some instances, it becomes poisonous for them. Wow. Um, natural diversity also involves things like nesting sites. Like if you change or reroute rivers, which they do when they dam, right. they flood over areas that are natural nesting. You're, and mecan- you're messing with a natural ecosystem. You're completely is- messing with it. And oh unpredictably, which makes it... An impossible environment for animals to live in. Look, you can't say it on the nature of things. I'm going to say it right now. That would be bullshit. Okay. I'm just going to throw it out there. Okay. Well, what is bullshit? Hold on. Is that your next documentary? No. 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 To mess with a natural ecosystem. Oh, like okay. if you start damming this, uh, damn the damming of the Magpie River. Okay. Number five. The right to perform its essential functions within its ecosystem which is everything from being able to do the big melt to flow into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, so it's, it's just, it has to be able to go through everything it's gone through for millennia. And there's so many ways outside of dams that we can affect that, that we need to be cognizant of. Number six, the right to maintain its integrity. Yes. Which is part of the whole thing of legal personhood is recognizing that things like rivers or forests uh, have a value outside of what they can do for us that they have inherent value unto themselves. And I think that is a big paradigm shift that once you really start to think about it and young people get it, they say, of course, but people of my age, you know, it's a, it's a real concept to embrace and, and it's a struggle, but you really, if you start to think about it, it makes perfect sense. Number seven, this also makes perfect sense. The right to be free from pollution. Duh. (laughs) All right. Number eight, the right to regenerate and be restored. Yes. So, I mean, the whole regeneration actually speaks not just to the river, but all the area around the river. Like the river gets its water from the runoff, uh, from snow melt. And, uh, you know, global warming is really affecting that snow melt. So this speaks to a much bigger issue. And here, I think this is one, we're going to need some more Susan on the end of this one, but this is kind of everything here. The right to sue. This is the biggie. This is the teeth. And the right to sue comes through legal guardians who are appointed by um, the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community who put this measure forward and got legal personhood. So they are going to appoint a couple of guardians, usually it's three, who speak for the river in court. And they already have people on the ground who are monitoring the river, making sure that everything is going as it should. So who will report back if there's changes or pollution or projects for, you know, anything like that, damning. Um, Because it's so remote, you need local people who are going to keep their eye on this river. And it's 300 kilometers long. I mean, it's not an easy thing to keep your eye on. Um, And so these guardians will represent the river in court. And that's really the bite. Because if you don't have the right to sue, a corporation has the right to sue. If you do something to Walmart, Walmart's going to take you to court guess what? You think about it before you do something to Walmart. Well, you should have to think about it before you do something to the magpie. Absolutely. Absolutely. The the right to sue is the bite there. That's that's everything here. Now, this airs February 1, so hopefully people uh, jump on this uh, episode of Toronto Mike'd. Uh, Maybe they catch up on the weekend, and then they're all set to go to CBC Jam or watch CBC on uh, February 1st, and they they can see it. They can learn more. Amazing. I'm so glad you dropped by to tell me about this. But do you know what your next project is going to be about? I do, but I never tell anyone. So, okay, (laughs) obviously you don't want to show your cards here, but maybe you give us like a like a clue. Are we back to animals? Yes. Okay, we're back so to animals. Because so we left animals for a river, but now we're back to uh, animals. I will give you one clue. Okay. Beep, beep. 
Okay, it's a Roadrunner. Okay, damn it, That's, that clue was. <laughs> I thought you were gonna do like a real subtle thing, like it's a, it's, it's they, would have been a lot smarter it in Ontario. if I had. No, no. <laughs> you find it in Ontario or something like that. I'm gonna be start thinking like, oh yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, very interesting. I'll start thinking on it. Okay, so I, I might as well tell you it's beep beep the true story of Roadrunners. <laughs> okay, don't forget the title. Like you forgot the poor uh, rabbit title here, but Susan. <laughs> How was this experience for you making your Toronto Mike debut? That's a long drive you made from Uxbridge. Well worth it. Well worth it. This was fantastic. Is for the lasagna? Is that why? Uh... No, for you and, and the lasagna. <laughs> well, thanks for telling us about, hey, it just, it's just, again, I'm going to borrow from the live stream because the people in the live stream are uh, far more eloquent than I am. But uh, incredible that a river has legal rights. Thanks for going through these. This This is like... Mind blows and fun facts, and there's going to be so much more in the dock that we can all see uh, on CBC Gem or on CBC on uh, February 1st. And uh, I really appreciate you telling me all about it. And thank you, Jill, for that line that hooked me. You want to hear the line again before we uh, sure. say goodbye? Thank here? you, Jill. Because I, I will. This is the truth, and Cam Gordon can attest to this because he was in PR and he used to pitch me on all these things, and I did this thing with him, which is rude. I completely ignored because I get so many. And Jill's sentence that got me was, The beautiful and fast-flowing Magpie River in northern Quebec has become Canada's first natural phenomenon to be granted legal personhood. So, A, I didn't know about this Magpie River. I, did, I had no idea that a, some piece of nature, some, some natural phenomenon could be granted legal personhood like, as you said, like a corporation or a boat or whatever. Like, this was mind blow to me. And then when I learned a subject matter expert would drive from Uxbridge and tell me about it, and I'd get some bonus fun facts about crows and raccoons and moose. I said, you had me at hello, Jill. Let's make this happen. <laughs> so thank you, Jill. Thank you, Susan. I hope that this uh, documentary, I Am the Magpie River, is a huge success. Thank you. And thank you for this today. And that brings us to the end of our 1,418th show. You can follow me on Twitter and Blue Sky. I'm at Toronto Mike. We've already learned you're not on social media, Susan, but is there any website we can go to to learn about what's going on with your filmmaking? Anywhere you want to send us? <laughs> no. Nowhere. Okay, you just got to go to episode 1418 to learn everything about uh, Susan Fleming. It's all right here. Much love to all who made this possible. That's Great Lakes Brewery, Palma Pasta, don't leave without your lasagna, Recycle My Electronics, Raymond James Canada, and Ridley Funeral Home. See you all Monday. It's the return of Brother Bill. He's back on the radio in Edmonton. We're going to talk about what's new with Brother Bill, a.k.a. Neil Morrison. That's happening Monday. See you all then. <laughs>